and insulating the whole building. You know, I would. You, you guys are <laughs> gonna be. Uh, it's unexpected to hear me say this, but I think we need some woofy modeling uh, of, of this assembly, right? <laughs> and does anyone know what that means? I don't even know what it stands for. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Rob Wadsack, Digital Brand Manager. Hey, guys. Brian Pontalillo, Editorial Director. Hey, everyone. And our longtime producer, Jeff Rose. Hello. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, it is good to see you guys today. How are y'all doing? Great. How about you? <laughs> I'm all right. I was yeah. uh, uh, privileged to be part of the BS and Beer webinar last night with a discussion of wood heat, which I found pretty interesting. Uh, these two guys were talking about technologies that some of you probably haven't heard of. So if you have an interest in that subject, I would totally tell you to go check that out. It was pretty interesting. Where, Rob, you B, where can they find BS and Beer, Patrick? On the uh, Green Building Advisor website, there is a uh, link to all the shows, and you can find that one in past uh, episodes right there on the page. Cool. And I think we have it on our uh, website too, Rob. Is that correct? Uh, actually, no. It's it's on the Green Building Advisor website. We do promote it on our our site, but uh, but it's actually Green Building Advisor website, and it's also on the BS and Beer YouTube channel. Cool. And you can find it as a podcast now, right? That's correct. Um, you know, it, it's a very, it tends to be a visual presentation. And so, um, so we're not sure how, how, you know, how great it's going to be as a podcast, but we did have a lot of people asking us for it. So we decided why not, um, why not put the audio up so people can listen to it? I think a lot of the times the audio will be fine. And once yeah. in a while you might have to go grab your computer and watch the video to see what they were talking about. What's so yeah. great about podcasts generally is that you can do them while you're doing other stuff. And I think that makes them appealing to a lot of tradespeople who, you know, can do that while they're working. And or, or DIYers too. Or commuting too. Yeah, I, I, I tell you, I've been getting through my basement remodel by just, you know, binging podcasts. So uh, what are you doing down there, Rob? I'm um, just still cleaning up, making space for my tools, but uh, I'm finally getting to use this space a little bit, but not for anything that I, that uh, my family wants me to do, like building kitchen cabinets. I, <laughs> Andy Angle gave me a, a couple of old antique bikes, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, and I uh, didn't know what I was going to do with them. And uh, one of them is a Columbia, probably from the 40s. And uh, I just started stripping that thing down and cleaning up all the old parts. It's been repainted several times. I'm trying to get it down to the original paint. And what is the uh, protocol with historic bicycles? Like, you know, furniture, you're not supposed to refinish or change in any way. But like, does it matter with bikes, Rob? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's the same thing with cars a lot lately. It used to be that people would find an old car and they, the, the, the natural thing for a rare vehicle would be to completely restore it, strip it down, restore it as best you could to its original state. But so much more often now I see people trying to preserve things. They might still make them mechanically sound, but uh, preserve them in the state that they are found in to sort of, sort of show the you so know, rusty they, bikes are cool. history. Uh, honestly, to tell you the truth, I've got a bunch of old Schwinn Stingray bikes, and when they look all shiny and new, they just look—they're just too shiny and new to me. I, I like the ones that are that have the sticker from the 1970s from the local bike shop that the person bought it at, and uh, um, actually, one of them has a sticker on the bumper uh, on the tailgate. Uh, I mean, tailgate, the fender that says uh, uh, "Save gas, drive slow." <laughs> so that, uh, that puts it places it in time right doesn't it yeah brian what have you been doing you've been working on your bicycle yeah, no i have not been working <laughs> on a bicycle my bicycle could need could use some work so um uh, but i'm gonna wait till i get it here in connecticut and i'm gonna bring it over to rob um <laughs> he's gonna have a workshop to take care of that for you yeah i i looked at it um i i, I was, had an interesting couple of weeks because i looked at a uh, a few houses um uh, over the past, um, over the past couple of weeks. And that's always an interesting process. Can I guess they were overpriced? Well, yeah, and that's a, that's a whole different story. They were, 
they I don't know if they were overpriced, but what I'm finding is that they're going for over asking price. So maybe the asking prices seemed fine, but they're just like they're just uh, they're just going really fast in this in this market and often for you know ten or twenty thousand dollars or more over over asking price, which makes it you know uh, maybe maybe not the best time to buy if you don't need to or really really want to. Um, what the the most interesting um, part of the process though was was this week when I um, looked at a had a house that I, I really actually liked a lot and, and actually fit uh, the bill for a lot of both um, both what we like about homes and also um, what we're looking for in a home. Uh, but I, but the, the realtor let me know, she, she, she sent me the inspection report from the, the previous um, potential buyer who actually backed out because of the inspection report. And I looked over the report and, and I wasn't too... I wasn't too, I wasn't scared away by the by the what the inspector had found, and so I said you know I'd still like to I'd still like to take a look at this place um, because a lot of it was like um, there was some woodpecker damage to the siding, and you know I'm you know I'm not uh, I'm not unwilling to you know do some repair work on siding. In fact, I don't you know look forward to a project like that. Um, but but um, so nothing on the nothing on the the inspection report really scared me away too much. And, but when I got to the place and when I started looking at it, it was, it became very clear that this was a house that, you know, was going to need tens of thousands of dollars in repairs, if not, if not a hundred thousand dollars in repair work over the next 10 years. Um, And some of it, some of it very much safety issues. I mean, I saw cantilever deck joists that were rotting away. You know, the middle of the joist, there was there was almost no meat left. Um, when I looked in in attic spaces and little closets that had been created within the wall, I could see you know not only no insulation but lots of signs of of water yeah. getting getting into the walls. So the amount of the amount of obvious problematic conditions in this house was not reflected on that ex- inspection report at all. And I started to think to myself about inspections you know and i remember we had a, a we had a commentary written by gary katz a number of years ago he ran into some trouble right he had and he because he bought a house um in a out of state so he was living in california if i remember the story right he was living in california was buying a house in oregon and so i think he might have bought the house site and seen or he or he visited it quickly but then sent an inspector to look at the house and because of the what inspectors home inspectors do and don't do um what he Gary had a did, ton of rot repair. Yeah, he didn't know about rotted sills and yeah. rotted floor joists and stuff like that. There were things that were under the house that the and you know that the inspector just didn't look at, and it brought this this process brought that really to light for me. And um, you know, I know that that's a challenging job. I know that they do have restrictions and that they try to look at certain um, you know significant safety issues and big ticket items. And they but he didn't find hands. those either. He didn't find those either. <laughs> And what and 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 even even just the even what you wouldn't have gotten from this inspection report was the amount of these items, how signif- how significant these items were, you know. I mean, a note about the deck repairs done improperly, you know, that doesn't really that that still it says well the deck was repaired, but when you saw some of how you know one very very large deck, probably a couple hundred square feet, held up by you know two by six. Two by sixes were the posts, and they were just and they were stuck in the ground. Oh my gosh! So it was it was a it was kind of a fascinating uh, process to go through. Um, still an awesome house, and and if I was looking for um, if I was looking for a bigger project, I, I, I still a house I might, might have likely considered, but it was it was a little too big, and it was also a challenging, you know, as a as someone who's not afraid to work on their own houses, but knowing that you're going to be working alone, you have to take the complexity of the home into consideration it was built into a hillside and would have had some tough areas for staging and you know setting up ladders and that kind of thing and so i started to think about like not only the the amount and and price tag on all these repairs but also the complexity of doing them without a crew what did they want for this place brian so it was uh three bedrooms two baths um on three acres i believe it was around 2,000 square feet, and it was 260. Mm. 
that's like the, you know, kind of entry point pretty much around here, right? 200s, yeah. you know. Wow. Yeah, she said, and, she, and that, that price had come down a little bit, but she also said that, you know, that they, they, they were, you know, the realtor said that, that you know, they weren't going to budge on that price. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I think that, that um, I think she said that's why the previous deal fell through because, you know, the, they got repairs. The, the owners saw the inspection report, saw that there were repairs needed, tried to, tried to, you know, get some money off the price. And the owner just said, you know, you know what the market is, you're going to hold out. Did you uh, feel disheartened by this process? Or are you keeping your chin up and going to look at other places? No, I'm not disheartened. I feel like I have, you know, the luxury of um, time. You know, I don't, I don't, we don't need to do anything immediately. You know, and if it's, if it's not a smart market to buy in, then you're not you know, gonna, not gonna, you rent. Jeff, what have you been doing around your place? Uh, lots of little stuff, nothing major, you know, fix a chair, fix a light. Nothing. Do you like that kind of fussy stuff? Um, yeah, for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. It's like easy and it's done. <laughs> There's definitely something to appreciate about easy and done. I did a little home networking to uh, make Carol's life easier this past weekend. Uh, she's had a wireless connection on her work computer and it's uh, proved to be a problem in, in uh, more recent days. So she asked me to run a cable from our uh, modem to the you know, her workstation. So we did that and ran another one so she can do, um, have the computer connected to the network when she's doing little videos, uh, in the basement for fine gardening with, uh, where she has her seed starting, uh, area. So that was kind of a similar project, Jeff, where, uh, it had a beginning at about 10 o'clock in the morning and by, you know, two or three in the afternoon, I was done and, uh, enjoying the playoff games. So that was kind of fun. And, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do this weekend. All right. So we heard from a number of folks this uh, week, as we often do. This comes from Andrew, and this was in regard to uh, Home Depot's fine for violating uh, lead safety protocols. Hey, guys, in episode 315, you referred to an article about the Home Depot being fined $40 million for lead paint safety violations. I thought I would share my experience with lead. One of our four children tested high for lead in 2020. It was like the sky was falling. The system was awakened. My child was put in a monitoring program and specialists were notified. Naturally, my wife was very concerned, so I started researching. The child's lead test came back at 10. How bad is that, you ask? Treatment isn't considered until levels are 45. I had the opportunity to speak with one of the specialists. She's been doing lead monitoring and treatment in children for 30 years. So what's done for high lead levels, you may ask? The child is placed on iron supplements and you're told to give them plenty of citrus and milk. After all the scare tactics, I was expecting something more invasive. The specialist said when the levels get too high, above 45, they can clean the blood through something similar to dialysis. Uh, As we live in Iowa with very old housing stock, I wondered how bad is this crisis? How often does a child chest that high? I asked thinking it must be in the thousands or at least hundreds per year. In her 30 years of doing lead testing and treatment, seeing thousands of children, she's known of exactly one case of a child being treated for lead poisoning. Other than that, they tell you to eat well and get tested every six months. I'm sure there are some horror stories about children with lead poisoning, but those percentages are incredibly low. I think our time and resources would be far better spent on problems like cancer, diabetes, car crashes, etc. Thank you, Andrew. What do you guys think about this? Well, I've I've known a few people who have had children who have had uh, serious high lead, uh, le- lead levels who've lived in older homes or had older furniture in their houses, and uh, what, I know do they have one, to go undergo treatment, Rom. Yeah, I mean, it's the same kind of thing where it's 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 if it's not like life threateningly high, but it's high enough to be on the chart. They, um, um, I know at least one of them had to be reported to the local like county health department for monitoring and that dietary things that dietary and supplements are, are like how they, you know, unless it's like seriously high, how they tell you to deal with it. So it's like over time, you're trying to sort of wash it out of your system by the, the, the things you're taking into your body. Um, I did do a, qu- a quick little bit of research about it. And um, for years, there wasn't really a whole lot of data on how it affects people long term because like in the short term if you catch it it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot 
of damage. But uh, this one medical study I found said that uh, they, they had a data set of about 14,000 people and they did follow ups with them years later. And they were saying that uh, even small amounts of lead led to serious problems over time. And they said that um, people who had um, in, in the study, people who ha were, had lead, high lead levels were 70% more likely to die from cardiovascular disease. Well, and, and they have problems, kids have problems learning, you know, it gives you neurological problems and, you know, yeah, lead is not something that's supposed to be in your system is the point I would make. What do you think, yeah. Brian? Well, I, I mean, this isn't, this, uh, this isn't the first time that I've, I've heard this or any of us, right. I've heard this, this, um, story. We all know that the issues and health risks with lead, um, curiously, I feel like, um, I feel like every time I hear about a, a very specific case, it is related to ch a child or children. And so I, I, I am curious, I'm, I wonder about that, um, if, if there's a reason, if there's something in, in beha the behavior activity of children that... They eat paint chips is the problem, or they eat soil around, you know, uh, they're, highways. They're, because they're playing on the floor yeah. and in, and in it, the dust and... And it disproportionately affects poor children because they live in substandard housing and are more likely right. to live close to, you know, major transportation uh, corridors. Yeah. Yeah, the one child that I knew who was reported to the local health department, uh, they lived in an old house, but but when they knew they were having a baby, they did their best work to encapsulate all the lead paint in the house, uh, all the floor paint and the wall paint. And so they were like freaking out because they're like, well, what's going on here? And it turned out it was uh, an antique rocking chair they bought at some tag sale. Mm. And it was in the living room where the kid was a toddler and learning how to walk and was like holding onto that chair constantly and then probably licking their fingers or eating their food or whatever. And, and it was like seriously high levels of lead from just that one piece of furniture. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, that's a great point to bring up actually, because we, we talk about the lead, lead paint in, you know, on, on houses pretty regularly because we talk about remodeling a lot and that, you know, so it's, a, it's, it's constantly a reminder to be careful of, of lead paint when you're working on old house, but there's other places where you'll find lead paint, not just on the house. And yeah. I think the point Rob makes is, is great. Little kids, like, you know, they're constantly putting their hands in their yeah. mouth after touching things. And if the ball is rolling around the lead coated floor, you know, it's going to be on the ball or the matchbox right. car or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other family that I know of close by, uh, live in an old farmhouse and uh, they are pretty sure that it was uh, in the soil around the house from probably once they had someone had scraped and repainted the house. Yep. Yeah. That's why the you know RPP rules uh, exist, right? Because it's that's something that people didn't used to pay attention to, and they'd let the chips go all over the ground, and then the kids play in it. And especially when they're little, you want them around the house. <laughs> <laughs> not going to the playground. Um, so Andrew, we have a couple of physicians that listen to the show regularly. I know of. So, uh, if you doctors out there want to weigh in further on this subject, I would love to hear from you. Uh, we also heard from as coincidentally, Dr. Lee in this episode about last episode, uh, Hello, FHB podcast crew. I appreciate your engaging and informative discussions, particularly the mention of the importance of interior humidity levels on one's health from show 315. It's worth mentioning that there is another very important reason that interior humidity should not be too low. The ideal range is 30 to 50%. That is the ability to effectively remove pathogens from the air by filtration. Virus particles don't have wings to fly on their own, so they hitch a ride on airborne respiratory droplets when the humidity is too low, the size of the combined respiratory droplet slash virus complex can be too small for effective filtration. In other words, depending on one's filter efficacy, it can require too many passes to filter. Most filters in residential and commercial environments are somewhere between MERV 7 and MERV 13. Most of us don't have blower motors robust enough to push the air through to MERV 20, which is a HEPA filter. And he includes a, a link that I'll put on the podcast notes. Um, what I've done in my office is upgrade to the highest rated filter my blower motor will handle, MERV 13. I've added UV lights in the ducts and only run the office HVAC when the thermostats call for conditioned air to avoid unnecessary mixing of air between rooms. 
and I supplement it with individual room HEPA uh, filtration, which are a hundred more. No, this, excuse me, hyper HEPA. Have you guys heard of hyper HEPA? No, I hadn't either. No. So, so he says they're a hundred times more efficacious than HEPA air filters. The ones I have run continuously. Um, C I Q air.com. I have no financial interests, but that will explain some, uh, I've published four videos on indoor air quality on my YouTube channel. If anyone needs a cure for insomnia, thanks again. And keep up the good work. Dr. Lee PS don't use bungee cords. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys know this, that you need uh, a certain humidity level to filter viruses? I sure not. I mean, you know, I, I, I never really thought about it, but I, but I have, um, I don't know where it came up recently, but the idea that, you know, everything, I mean, that all of this stuff does travel on moisture droplets. Like you said, a, a virus does not mm. travel on its own. It, it, need, it needs something to hitch a ride. So, uh, the, the, the flip side of that is that when the humidity level is higher, that it makes it easier for, uh, for that stuff to, to move around, which is why you got to be careful in certain environments. But, um, is that, but, is that the first time you've ever used the word efficacious, Patrick? I, that's a, it might I, be, I Rob. Did I pronounce it correct, do you think? <laughs> I think I think so, yeah. <laughs> we also heard from Jeff in Bainbridge Island, Washington. He uh, commented on his favorite tools that we asked listeners to, to send in their uh, suggestions. Uh, you guys want to guess number one? Well, of course, you see the script, but I'm going to ask listeners. Yes, you're right. It's an oscillating tool. Uh, number two is his drywall hoist, which I would totally agree is another mm -hmm. amazing thing when you're hanging drywall. A uh, battery-powered chainsaw and pole chainsaw. Uh, four is a boroscope. Five is an LED headlamp, which that has changed my life. Yeah, those are all on my list. That's for sure. Well, except the boroscope. I haven't. I, I got one of those things. I, don't, I haven't used it too much. You'd think I would in this old house use it more, but. Yeah. So do you have a really good one, Rob, or do you have one that's like in the tens of dollars range? Like, no, I've got, it's, a, it's a Milwaukee one. It's, it's not bad. So it has an LCD screen and a little camera at the end. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And do you find it confusing when you stick it in somewhere and you don't know which way is up? That's the part I've never been able to <laughs> figure out. <laughs> yeah. You got, I mean, you got to make sure you look for good visual cues in the wall to get your bearing, you know? I hear the the better ones can like electronically write it themselves, but I, I the ones I've tried to use I find very confusing to look at. Oh boy! So here's our first question from Jerry. Jerry says, "I'm newish to the building industry. I was mostly a self-taught DIYer until I fell into a building maintenance role, then worked as an assistant carpenter, and now I'm a project manager for a design build company in Michigan." The podcast has been a great addition to my commute and while tracking from one job site to the next. I mostly got my feet under me, but we recently started a whole house remodel on an interesting house. It was built in the 50s. The main floor consists of foundation walls and concrete slab, sort of like a split level. The walls are blocked from the slab to the top of the second floor. The blocks are three inches tall by 12 inches wide by eight inches deep. The existing house had furring strips nailed right to the block and drywall plaster on that with no insulation to speak of. The trusses look hand-built on site. As part of our renovation, we have removed all the existing drywall and plaster and are building two by four walls on the interior side of the block wall to give space for outlet switches and forced air ductwork. The only wall cavities in the house are above the front door on the lower level and all the way up the gable end wall and in the top one foot of wall on the second floor. The inspectors have told us that we only need to insulate wall cavities that we expose during demolition. So basically one eight foot wall section and then the header space on the second floor. By framing new walls on the inside of the block section and then the upper header space on the second floor, oh, excuse me, by framing new walls on the inside of the block, we have the opportunity to insulate more, but how? Some of my colleagues say we should foam it all. Some people have warned that if we insulate too well, the block will hold moisture and during the winter will stay cold and freeze leading to deterioration. One thought is to use relatively basic insulation like fiberglass that will help hold heat in, but would still allow some heat to dry the block to the outside. Am I thinking about this wrong? Is this a common problem? It seems strange in our area, but maybe this is a common assembly in other areas or in commercial buildings. What is the best way to handle this? I really appreciate your time and all the long conversations you have for our delight. <laughs> <laughs> 
so I'm not going to read uh, the rest of Jerry's correspondence, but I emailed him for some uh, uh, details about how this, this uh, structure is built. And he sent me a bunch of photos. So if you all want to see this place, it's pretty cool. Um, go to the podcast page and have a look. So what do you guys do with block walls? How do you insulate them? What, what, this Patrick, is like, what did he say about the, just before we start, what did he say about the exterior um, of the building? Did he say how it was finished? Yeah, give me a sec here. Start talking and I'll figure that out here. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that um, he, he points to a concern that is common in, in old brick um, homes, structural brick walls, which is that often they, it, it, there's the potential for the problem um, exactly as he noted it, right? There's the potential that, um, that with, with old brick walls, that if we keep, um, if we keep heat from the warming wall, them, warming them in the winter time, that those, those types of walls can be susceptible to damage with freeze thaw cycles. Yeah. So the colder climates, it's really a concern. So colder, yeah, yeah. The colder the climate, the more of a concern it is. Concern is once you're in a mild climate, it's, it's not much of a concern. And Rob pointed out, we were talking about this a little bit before we, we, press the record button and Rob pointed out that you know brick is a different material than concrete um you still have more mortar joints here but but concrete's not nearly as as porous and susceptible to the taint same type of damage as as brick is um in general my my thought on this is that in general if he has a two by four wall framed inside this and if that's all he's going to insulate he likely is has nothing to be concerned about the point I always make when we get asked this question on, you know, mass walls, masonry walls is um, overhangs make a huge difference in the as assemblies. Like it, it is way more forgiving to insulate on the inside if you have good overhangs on the outside because it that's keeps that off. That's exactly why I asked about the exterior finish, because if, you know, water management is huge, right? It's so huge. are you are you keeping these walls dry with your overhangs, with your siding, with flashing details? You know, or are they getting soaked all the time? That that matters. Yeah, I think we've talked about this before, how if you look at old masonry buildings, especially brick and sandstone, more porous materials, uh, a lot of the fancy architectural details on those buildings are actually water shedding details to, to reduce the amount of moisture that's being absorbed into large sections of, of an exposed wall. But overhangs are really the best thing for that. So this house has two foot overhangs on the eave side, which is fantastic, right? That is a very good overhang, but the gable ends don't have any. So my guess is that's going to be where it's uh, riskiest. Mm -hmm. um, and, in, in, and in general with concrete, um, as you alluded to earlier, Patrick, in general, it doesn't need to dry. Concrete, if, concrete can get wet and stay wet. I mean, bridges have underwater concrete column right <laughs> concrete can be wet for the life of the concrete now the one thing though is that i'm looking at those pictures and they're a funny reddish color so he calls them block but i wonder if they're terracotta block you know so that was really common in in certain uh era of homes in pittsburgh was this clay block and mm -hmm. we used to call it speed block i don't know where that word came from but it was had like flutes on the inside and, and they would plaster directly on that and you know that was the wall and it often had a brick veneer on the outside and there was no insulation. But these houses, at least in my experience, were surprisingly airtight. And I'm guessing it's because of the plaster veneer on the over all the masonry, right? I think that makes a pretty good air barrier. And I'm sure it also allows drying to the inside, uh, assuming you don't have some kind of uh, impermeable paint or wall covering on there. So, yeah. But, but yeah, it, oh, go ahead. The, the standard recommendation for these types of structures has always been to insulate on the exterior. Am I right, Brian? If possible, I mean, yes, if yeah. possible. I mean, I think that's the you know, the exterior, gold standard. Exterior insta insulation is always is always when when possible. You know, it always it brings your structure inside the conditioned building envelope, and it almost always makes for um, a better option, a more durable building. But then you, in this case, you got this old historic building, right, with stained glass and cool details. And then what do you do? You cover it up with a stucco layer, and right. you know it's not the same house anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's trade offs. Um, I don't. I again, I don't think in, in in it's always worth finding a local expert on on diff, on building types if you have any questions or any concerns. But I don't think insulating a two by four wall inside inside this block wall is going to be an issue. 
but is it going to help? I, you know, that's the other thing. Is I it going to help? That's a good question. I, you know, is it money well spent? And especially as he alluded to, if they're only going to insulate the walls that they are opening up and touching, as the inspector said that they had to do, you know, so they're they're not even insulating the whole building. You know, I would. You, you guys are <laughs> going to be. Uh, it's unexpected to hear me say this, but I think we need some woofy modeling uh, of of this assembly, right? <laughs> And does anyone know what that means? I don't even know what it stands for. Oh man, I don't know. Woof, but the 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 short answer is Woofy is a is an energy and moisture modeling software that basically people uh, only building scientists and serious building science geeks use to uh, um, to basically look at an assembly in a particular location and model how it's going to perform for uh energy performance or is it durability as well brian i think i'm not sure it's both exactly. yeah it's, it's both because it, it's 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 um moisture high management growth, high growth high growth thermal modeling mm -hmm. yeah so it, it can tell you both yeah th th this is more of a bs and beer conversation than a fhb podcast conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even know what woofy stands for we're gonna get well, drawn and quartered by the folks who do that it, all the time it is a it is a great thing to bring up though, Patrick, because so many of the so many of the efficiency questions that um, that we discuss, you know, on the podcast or on BS and Beer or in more casual conversations, can be answered with different types of energy modeling. And so, and if you're willing, if you really don't know what the right decision is, you're whether it's worth you know triple pane windows, whether it's worth R thirty eight in your walls, like there's there's a person with a computer program that can tell you. But there's been some, you know, concern uh, in uh, in the building science community that, that this modeling is not always accurate. Is that isn't that right, Brian? Well, I know um, with double stud walls. There's a there's a lot of red flags with the double stud walls. But then the people who actually build those double stud walls, I've been Bowie, I'll tell you that uh, are um, are not as concerned because they haven't seen any problems that the models would suggest would happen. Right. That's what, that's what, that's the inaccuracies that I have heard of where, um, yeah, where the models show, um, a problem that doesn't a, a exist problem that, that doesn't exist. And we do have some, um, it, it's great because we're getting more and more feedback from, from builders and architects who are monitoring their buildings now, like Ben and Dan Colbert and others who are putting sensors in their walls. Um, and uh, and sometimes even better when they get to go back and remodel something and actually look in the walls, uh, you know, so that so that we can kind of see how how different um, how different assemblies perform. Yeah, double stud walls like the models will tell you that it, that a double stud wall um, has a good a good chance of condensation moisture, on the inside moisture yeah. accumulation. Yeah, yeah, on the inside of the exterior sheathing, and that there's all these and the, and the walls get really complicated as you try to mitigate for that, but builders of double stud walls don't seem to be able to find the problem in their built work. Yeah. I mean, Jerry, the good thing is, the good thing Jerry is mentioned that, we, that one of his colleagues uh, suggested uh, spray foam, right? And, and that's a, a common solution or a common method to insulate these walls. And it helps with the air sealing, uh, you know, so I mean, and moisture management and moisture management, but it's expensive and there's some, you know, it's an imperfect material. I think we'd all agree. Jerry, I'm sure that was completely unhelpful. So uh, <laughs> if you have another question, some other time, maybe we'll do a better job. Well, I, you know, honestly, like when we when we get the really complicated questions, I mean, uh, not that I, I want to uh, like pass off responsibility of, of helping people with stuff like this, but go to the greenbuildingadvisor.com forum and you will basically get like the same kind of, you know, feedback that you would expect to get if you went and hired an engineer to, to yeah, actually from people who know what they're talking about. Yeah. And yeah. And like I said earlier, I really think, you know, lo sometimes the best thing you can do is find a local expert. It's often, you know, Patrick, you mentioned it before about these, you know, houses being built in the um, Pittsburgh area, right? It's often that, you know, similar construction types happen within, you know, communities and mun municipalities. And so there's people who have experience with that. Yeah, yeah. You know, find, perfect, find that person. A perfect example of that, I was talking to a good friend of mine who lives in a neighborhood where all the houses were built by the same build developer of the same period. And his contractor pretty much works exclusively in that town. 
And so like he's got a, you know, drain pipes buried under a slab in his basement. He wants to put a bathroom in and the, the contractor's like, oh yeah, I know where they put the pipes in these houses because he's worked on so many of them. <laughs> That's, you know? the so you like, yeah. <laughs> That's the guy you want. That's the guy you want. Uh, so this is, I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about this next question. This comes from Phil. Hi podcast. I'm a kitchen and bathroom modeler and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on certifications such as CAPS, certified aging in place specialist, CKBD, certified kitchen and bath designer, NAHB member, etc. Do they help contractors get jobs? Do potential clients feel better if a contractor has letters after their name on their business card? It makes sense since we're not, you know, normally accredited like engineers and architects. I look forward to your comments. Cheers, Phil. So do you guys have you heard any of these certification yeah. programs? What's your favorite, yep. Brian? What do you do My you uh, have a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't necessarily have a favorite. I mean, I think I can. I think I can respond to his question um, in the, in and basically kind of say, um, well, a couple of things. First of all, it's, it can't hurt, and you might learn something getting the. You know, you might learn and and, and grow as a professional getting the certification, um, and and also when you look at organizations that do this would do these certifications, you know, they often they often look problematic when you look deeply at the organizations. Um, so I've talked to over all. Why do you say that, Brian? I, I, I think that's kind of a, a bomb to drop. Um, well, like, like NAHB, for example, um, you know, NAHB, when you, at the heart of it is a lobbying organization. And so, you know, um, there, in fact, just today, there's a piece in the New York times about NAHB and their influence on the building codes. And that's, so that's what you're, you know, that's, you, you have to be, they're, they're a political organization, they're a lobbying organization. So to, to want to be involved, you also need to be behind what they stand for and what they're lobbying. And that's why I say problematic, not problematic, like it's a bad organization. It's up to each person to decide whether they kind of stand with the organization. I'm sure the National Kitchen and Bath Association, which is also a huge organization, does some of that as well. Um, you know, so that's, that's why I say problematic. Because and maybe problematic is not a, the, the right word to use because I definitely don't want to throw the organizations under the bus. I don't want to I don't ha, I'm not staking an opinion on that. Just that, you know, maybe look at what the organization is and does with your money before you decide whether you want to support that or not. Mm. Um, so but at the same time, so to get back to the question at hand, like over the years of talking to many professionals, builders, remodelers, um, kitchen and bath designers and whatnot, I've, I've just seen so many different tracks that work. You know, you have the, you have the, um, Paul DeGroote, right? He's an architect in, um, Austin, Texas that we've worked at a, over the years, a lot at fine home building. He is a one person shop, works in a nice office above his garage. Um, doesn't advertise, isn't a member of any organizations, works through word of mouth and has had plenty of work for as long as he has wanted to work for. That's, that's one model that works. You know, he tends to work in, in, in these neighborhoods where, you know, one, you know, family passes on his info to the next family. And, you know, from one job, he's, he's a few houses down the street on the next job. And that's one way to work. I've talked to plenty of kitchen and bath designers who, who really are grateful for being part of um, NKBA as an organization and, and how it's helped them in their careers. It's, there's networking there. And, and probably for people who don't have a word of mouth recommendation, it probably is comforting to see that the person is certified, qualified, credentialed, you know, it so, tells me something about them right away. Is that they at least care enough to to get training, right? It's there's right. so many folks in our industry who are flying by the seat of their pants, doing things that they learn from who knows what or knew, who knows who, and uh, you know, it, it at least tells me that this person is trying to do a good job. And um, of course, there's a lot more to being a contractor than just doing good work, uh, but it's a good start, I would say. What do you think, Rob? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of was thinking the same thing along the same lines as Brian is that it's, uh, you know, you you might find that you'll learn some, you might have some mar marketing resources available to you that you didn't have without being a member of one of those organizations, or that you'll meet some peers who you can swap ideas with, uh, you know, which is becoming increasingly easier now with the, you know, 
with social media and and digital communication. I mean, you have a lot more people around the world sharing, so swapping stories and 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 tips with each other. Um, but yeah, the same thing too. It's like you know, there, there it shows. It, to me, something like that shows that you're actually working towards uh, continuing your improving the way you do business. If you're if you're if you're going for extra education and certifications like that. But but who knows? I mean, it, it, whether or not that actually impresses a particular client or not is is just speculate, speculation. It's similar to th- all the... Uh, oh, sorry, Patrick. No, please. Go ahead, Brian. I was just going to say it's similar to, in a way, I think, of all the, all the different kind of um, green building and, um, you know, passive house certification, lead certifications, all these that, um, that are, tend to tend to... Uh, well, they have this. They have a, they have a similar relationship, and they're a good example. A lot of architects and builders that I've I've talked to about these organiz- these kind of certifications, they follow that path and they learn a whole lot. And then a little ways down the road, they find that they're building a lot of homes that 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 may may meet those certifications um, and those standards, but they're not they're not actually taking the path of certification for their homes anymore. Um, because they, they, they've actually learned from the education and now they don't necessarily need to go through the process every single time in every single home. This is sort of the idea of the pretty good house that Mike Maines and Dan Colbert and, and, the, and that crew uh, talk about a lot, um, you know, sort of doing the, doing the work, but, but not necessarily being beholden to the, you know, the, the actual standard, the actual certification to a, to a T. And then, but then they will all say every once in a while they get, they get a client that comes to them and they want that certification. The client comes, you know, the first phone call, they got the call because the client wants a passive house and they want, they want to go through the process. They want to pay the money. They want the plaque on the, on the door. And then, you know what? Great. They can deliver it. They just got the job. Yeah. Phil, I would say like anything, uh, get the certification on things you want to do. Don't get the certification on things you don't want to do. And, you know, I think it could help for sure, but I'm not sure that the, you know, that's going to lead to a lot of referrals, but if, if you get in, in front of somebody, I, I do think it could, could help. Rob, did any of the contractors you work for have, uh, have any of these certifications? Um, not back in the day. I mean, cause uh, I was, I was a carpenter before most of this stuff existed. So, uh, I, um, <laughs> I don't think that's true, but anyway, well, before people really knew about it. I mean, <laughs> you weren't a carpenter at the turn of the century, Rob. <laughs> no, but I mean, we're, we're a lot of the sort of like, uh, progressive programs for certification uh, it, it were, were popular. Um, but, um, no, I mean, I, I haven't really worked with people who at the time had, had, had a focus on that stuff, but I did certainly work with people who were constantly looking to, uh, you know, find out what the latest, uh, you know, information was so that they were doing the best that they could with, with, with any sort of project. I would say one thing I would say, if you are going to get certifications like that, make sure, um, I mean, if you're really focusing on that as, as putting that on your calling card, I mean, market just. Learn learn a, good, a decent amount about marketing. Make sure you put that information out there because I mean, you know, having those certifications is one thing, but letting people know about them is is just as important. Yes, Jeff, do you have anything to add to this before we uh, tackle another question? Um, not really. I mean, I, in my previous life, I I had letters after my name, but I've they, they don't. Did you find it to that. advance your career? Uh, no, because I was, but I I did learn a lot getting the certification. So I think Brian asked what you were certified in. Uh, I, I was certified technology specialist. So it was AV industry. So. Interesting. Nice. This is, this is a good question. This comes from Michael. Hey team, after listening to your podcast for over a year, my wife and I decided to do the, to do the smart thing and buy a 229-year-old house in the Berkshires. <laughs> nice. Surprisingly, although it's been several months, I still don't have any issues to write into you about. Yes, the porch is sagging, and we have no idea what's under the kitchen floor, but it seems to have had a history of good care, and the projects have been mostly dreaming about and preparing for the future, not fixing past renovations. I'm writing to you today about my somewhat unique hobby, which is low impact logging with a single horse. 
I often joke that I'm one of the few hobby loggers around, but I love the work and I think there's a real place for it, even in modern times. Just like we don't call someone an anachronistic when they use a shovel instead of an excavator to dig a hole, a single horse or a horse team can be the exact right tool for certain jobs, although I'm the first to admit that some holes do call for an excavator. This admittedly unique passion has had me thinking for the past years about the importance of sourcing wood locally whenever possible, a topic you've skirted up against several times but have never addressed directly. When we buy locally, we're supporting our communities directly and we're not buying into the illusion of preservation where we just choose to place the resource burden on some faraway, unseen, and often less regulated market. I'm curious what demand, if any, you see in the market for local wood and why or why not. Patrick, I would love, if, love it if you invited a forester and or logger, two different things, onto your Pro Talk series to talk about this. I'm happy to recommend some great folk. There is also a series of webinars coming up from the amazing people at Northern Woodlands on the topic that I would highly recommend. And finally, the subject of carbon storage and sequestration seems to come up often, and every time it does, I'm reminded of this excellent publication by UMass on the topic, and I'll include the link that Michael does on the podcast page. Please take a look. It answers a lot of the questions that you inevitably seem to have. Many thanks for the hours and hours and hours of great listening. All the very best. Michael. So I asked Michael about his logging partner, and he says, my partner in crime is named Hazel, an 18-year-old Belgian mare. I bought her for my mentor, Brad Johnson, who runs Third Branch Horse Logging in Vermont with his business partner, Derek O'Toole. They're the real deal, full-time hybrid operation harvesting with horses and a forwarder, which is a machine for carrying large loads of logs on logging roads. Hazel's more or less in semi-retirement living with me. I'd love to do this full time, but what it boils down to is there's just not enough demand yet for this kind of work. My only goal right now is to raise awareness of sustainable logging as a practice and maybe make people think twice about where their lumber comes from. Still, to get back to the original topic of my email, when I was working in Vermont on bigger jobs with a team of horses, the trees we were harvesting as responsibly as we could were going to the same pile of logs as everyone else's and then getting shipped to China to feed their housing boom. If there were more demand for and appreciation of for what we could get right here at home, it could benefit everyone and it could even benefit the forest. I'm really interested to know what you have to say on the topic. Would you pay extra for lumber you knew came from the state forest down the road? What if it came from a tree that used to stand in your backyard? All the best, Michael. So, Rob, would you pay more for trees that, or lumber that came from trees nearby? Would I pay more for it? Um, I mean... Sounds like no. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would kind of think that... Uh, I, my priority with this would be more about getting the stuff local, because I do like the, the idea of, of building with wood that came from my own property or one of my neighbor's property. I know uh, certainly in our part of the country, especially when you go a little further north into New England, that's a lot more common. And in, in, in the um, BS and beer conversation that you guys had last night about burning uh, wood for heat, uh, that was certainly uh, something that was brought up a little bit is that, you know, it kind of depends on where you live. I mean, we, we live in a perfect place. I, I could drive up and down Route 7, which is the local state highway around here, um, and go an hour north, an hour south. And every half quarter, every 15 minutes or half an hour, I'd pass another sawmill. You know, so, I mean, I, I thought about this actually when the lumber prices spiked I was wondering if more people would be going to some of these local mills uh, during this this building boom to get wood because maybe it is even more affordable compared to the stuff we're shipping from other parts of the country. What about you, Brian? Do you think there's a value on locally harvested forest resources? Well, I, I think that, um, well, first of all, I loved seeing the photos of, of him and his partner. <laughs> So thank you so thank you so much for sharing those those really kind of put a smile on my face this morning and what what a what a fun and, and excellent thing excellent hobby as he yeah, calls you, it you um, can follow him on Hilltown Horse Logging on Instagram if you want to see more pictures of her cool <laughs> um, I mean the the, my, the short answer is yes I'd pay more if I had the money yeah you know I mean there's so many things that and I, and I and I I think you know local seems to be one of those um, simple things that sim seems to be one of the simple decisions that we can make to, to live, build, 
um, all the things that we do in a improve more, our communities, right? improve our communities in a, in a, in a way that just helps out so much, whether it's climate issues, whether it's economic issues seems to help out so much, you know, but it's not lost on me that, that, that building a house is expensive, getting more expensive. And the more we learn about climate issues, efficiency, all this stuff, it just seems to make our houses more, ex- what, we, what we want to do and what there's potential to do just seems to make our, our houses and our buildings more expensive. And there's, I, I do feel like there's a reckoning that, that ha- has to happen there too. You know, that, that's not, you know, I, I certainly guilty of promoting everything that is climate friendly, that is, you know, um, uh, friendly to communities, socially friendly, you know, but again, it's not lost on me that, that the stuff comes at a cost and that, that, um, number one, um, not everyone can afford it. Number two, it's not making a whole lot of impact if it's a, you know, if it's a, lux- a luxury for the wealthy. So. Um, I love the idea. If I were building something and I was looking for some flooring and I had to, had the money to, and the opportunity to get it locally, sure, I'd love to. Especially from a guy like him. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, what do you think about this? I, I love the idea. And, and I just wonder, you know, it's like there's a, I think a lot of that stuff is going to be hardwoods and specialty woods rather than, you know, commodity dimensional lumber. Because... Um, it'd be a whole lot harder to get dimensional lumber locally in quantity. And to have it grade stamped and, you know, it's, the, it's, it's complicated. And dried and... Yeah, most you of know, I, I get I, so few chances to be superior. I'm going to take every advantage of my buying locally cut sawn white pine siding. You guys may mm-hmm. remember when yeah. I was building this barn, yeah. Dan Morrison observed that one of his neighbors was having this enormous white pine tree c- taken down. And he arranged to have the thing sawn at a local sawyer. And I bought a ton of it and I made it into siding. And it was one of the uh, projects that make the least sense uh, uh, when you look at it from an outside perspective, because it's very labor intensive. You got to handle these large pieces of wood to make siding, you know, resaw the edges, rabbit them to make a ship lap. But I can tell you, it is one of my very favorite things about the building. It looks fantastic from the outside. It holds paint really well. And I do take a, a certain amount of satisfaction in having those products come from what would have been a tree that would have been tossed into a, you know, a wood pile and let to rot. It, it was, it was something useful and beautiful and uh, admittedly, it was a splurge in my case, as Brian pointed out, but um, I think it was worth it. I built my kitchen cabinets from that same tree. <laughs> <laughs> Dan was working with us at the time, and he had a garage full of he had a garage full of uh, of pine. Everyone was building <laughs> building stuff with that. It was John great. Tetro made furniture out of it. And, yeah, it was great. Yeah. yeah, it was nice that he he took the initiative to do that. Well, you know, one thing is if, if if more people appreciate this, then you're going to have more resources to process stuff like that. I mean, I I know we have mills in the area that could have possibly processed that into deciding for you for a little bit of a premium um, and so that you didn't have to sit there with a table saw and a router for days and days making your making oh your boards. God, I wish I would have thought of that, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> but, I do, to, to Jeff's point, I do see when I, when I do see local lumber being used or or lumber milled from the site that the house is being built on, I tend to you know it, it tends to be used as finished materials, flooring, yeah. siding, trim, cabinetry, that kind of stuff thing. that I, shows, right? You right. Know. Yeah. Yeah, I can tell you if if we build a house because uh, like part part of this the cost of building a house comes down to the fact that over the decades we've just expected to just have more stuff and have more complexity and have more details in a house but honestly i mean like a friend of mine had a farmer tell him that when he moved into his old farmhouse on 5 acres he's like you know property is the enemy of leisure basically the bigger home and property you have the more stuff you got to take care of uh, we're going to build a house someday hopefully and if we do i will definitely be using local wood for the siding and the flooring, uh, minimally finished, you know, like oil finished, uh, floors and, uh, maybe unfinished siding under a deep overhang. And so certainly I, 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 I may, I would make that a priority if I were starting a project from scratch. Um, like Brian said, Michael, the photos are fantastic. Very much. Uh, thanks very much for sending those. And you all should take a look at Michael. And I love that, um, Hazel, 
is in semi-retirement, but I'm sure uh, enjoying a quality of life that uh, is pretty cool. So that's, that's awesome. Um, you guys may remember we had uh, Jim Collins on the Pro Talk podcast in uh, number 282. He's a landscape architect from Burlington, Ontario, Ontario, excuse me. And he, uh, he had a question for the podcast. Looking for some insight from the Energy Saving Masters, I have a 1970s side split in Burlington, Ontario that had an additional story added in the early 90s. We've been in the home for just over three years, and I know it has its share of bad building practices. Did I mention ductwork running through the attic? Yes, I know. My question relates to the garrison-style overhangs on the second story, and at the same time, some of the pop-out window and cantilevered portions of the main floor below. The siding and soffits were just redone when we, before we bought the house, so I would like to do some delicate removal of the soffit aluminum in the spring and do a good job air sealing and insulation job. As I do not want to add to the cost of additional siding, etc., I would like to cut and cobble between the joists with EPS foam with caulking or canned spray foam edges on the underside of the subfloor, then supplement with rock wool. Do you have any suggestions to keep the rock wool in place between the joists? I guess I could staple a drainable house wrap across it before I reinstall the soffit aluminum. There may be an old plywood soffit under the aluminum. I guess I should replace that instead and then reinstall the aluminum soffit. My question is the detailing of the return where the cantilevered joists meet the top plate. Do I block these openings with EPS as well? Double layer? So I'm gathering, Jim, you're asking how to air seal the underside of this overhanging floor on the second level of your house, right? And this is a common building science disaster inherent to this type of architecture that there's never anything on the bottom side of the joist. So this is a huge path for air leakage that then travels all the way down the joist and goes through the rest of the house through holes in the uh, bearing walls that connect levels of the structure. So you're right to want to air seal this. I guess the question is, how do we go about it? And my suggestion is if there is plywood underneath that aluminum is tape the seams, tape the corners, and just use that as your air barrier. If there's not, you're going to have to either add to the bottom of the joist or infill cut and cobble like you suggest to block off all those holes so air can't get in to the joist cavities. Am I missing something, guys? Well, like um, to, to explain, if for, for people who don't know, don't know what a garrison-style house is, I mean, it's basically when you've got this second floor overhanging the uh, lower floor and having a, a soffit like you would have a soffit over an over, or roof overhang. And the problem with these houses is that uh, particularly at the time period when they were built, it's like people didn't really know about air barriers yet. And and uh, especially when living in a colder climate like Ontario, it's a concern because you basically have this, it turns your floor system into ductwork that just sucks in air from the outside. And because of the weird transition of this overhang, um, you usually have these big openings that, like he said, he wants to pop off the soffit, which is underneath the, uh, the this overhang. Um, and uh, if it's open, he wants to get some foam in there. But yeah, so I mean, because my concern with if there was just plywood there with just taping the seams is that it well is there sh is just sheathing air sealed, you know, is that going to really be enough of an air barrier? So I mean. I would, I would definitely, if it's not that much trouble, even if I did find plywood underneath there, try you to fill open the it up. joist bays. I'd try to open it up and at least get something rigid uh, in plane with the inner lower wall uh, blocking off the ends of all those joist bays. Because I can tell you from experience in my balloon framed house that blocking off joist bays that communicate with the rest of the house from the outside is one of the biggest improvements and easiest and cheapest improvements you can make to a leaky old house. True. So, what do you think, uh, Brian? Yeah, I agree. I agree with Rob. And I, I did wonder in terms of doing this work and doing it um, efficiently and, and, and not kind of, you know, not kind of struggling working in these cavities, whether you're up on a ladder or um, whatnot. I wondered if it was a good opportunity for a, one of, you know, kind of a two-part foam kit, um, you know, get the blocking in there and then just use that two-part kit to kind of you know, go around the perimeter of the, of the whole area. And then you could, you could fill from, from there, you could fill with any fibrous insulation. So, yeah. um, it would help with, you know, you know, it's not great to rely on 
spray foam for air sealing. Um, so if he does go with a cut and cobble approach, for example, caulk's a better option or tape than than can spray foam. I, I think builders are just learning that it tends as, as the building moves, it tends to pull away from the framing, it tends to crumble at times. Uh, yeah, and the seasonal uh, take up of moisture by the framing members it could ultimately lead to a failure once they dry out, right? Right. Um, but in terms, of, you also have to be able to get the work done, and um, that's why I was wondering about the. You know, those two-part spray foam kits, they come in handy for certain tasks where you need to kind of um, cover an area with something that is going to, you know, give you some air sealing and some a little bit of insulating value. Yeah, I, I've actually used one of those kits in, in a house like this where they actually had plumbing in that overhang. And so pipes were freezing. And that was just sort of the, the quickest, easiest way to do it. If I was doing it on my own house, I think I would do what you were talking about, Brian, where you'd use pieces of foam or plywood or whatever you're going to use as your air barrier and tape or caulk those seams and, and certainly use a high quality, stretchy caulk, you know, so like a polyeth- polyurethane exterior caulk or something, something similar. Yeah, you guys have heard me say it before on the show that I love the modern air sealing tapes for, you know, they're clean, they really work well. They do have some a little elasticity so things can move seasonally and you know, it just it just works and you choke when you see the price of the stuff, but boy it's worth it, I would say. Yeah, and they're making them really convenient with different uh like, you know, split backers so you can peel half away and make it easier to work with and then peel the other half back after you've made your crease and so they're 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 certainly they're certainly getting pretty sophisticated these products yeah and you know a tape one thing about using a tape over a caulk is they could cut the foam or plywood or whatever it is not worry about how tight the joints are where you you're you you can cover a, a big gap with that uh w- one note too if he does find the plywood underneath there one suggestion i might have if he pulls off the aluminum soffit material is just get a crappy blade and a circular saw and instead of the depth of the thickness of the plywood and even if you're not getting all the plywood out you could just run that thing the length of the whole soffit in two passes and get a nice size opening that'll get the full clear width of the joists and you'll be able to pop you'll be able to slide your uh, plywood or foam whatever you're going to use as your air barrier up into those gaps without having to disturb where the plywood is underneath the edge of the of the uh, siding on both edges we do, Jim, have, I, we do I would tell you I would tell Jim, he's lucky to have vinyl siding. And I would say, mm. take off vinyl siding to do make this work easier. It, it comes off and goes back up so easily. There's no point in trying to work around that if it's difficult at all. I would say, pull off a course or two above the that overhanging area or in a one below. And I think it's going to make your air sealing job a lot easier. And, and getting off the aluminum soffit without damaging because... My experience is if you look at that stuff wrong, it gets bent and never looks the same again. We do have a nice detail for this on on GBA, and we can we can grab that illustration and put it on the show notes page. Um, I don't think I don't think he'll be able to um, do the do it exactly as drawn because it would require him to have some space below the framing for continuous rigid foam. But he could still take away some tips from it, and um, and anyone else who's dealing with this kind of thing might be able to use. Um, the details from that drawing. You know, I've talked for years without really working too hard at it, but there are um, building science problems with most architectural styles, right? This is one of them, right? And when you have a main roof that overhangs a porch or creates a porch on a structure, that's often another because there's no sheathing layer between the inside of the building and the outside. There's no sheathing behind that roof, right? So I would love for someone who listens to this show to help us develop a feature article that identifies all those problem areas on different architectural styles that we would have little drawings. And these are the things you should pay attention. And this is definitely one of those that I would put on that list is this overhanging detour on garrison colonial style homes is always a problem. That'd be, that'd be great. And you're, you're right, like capes and insulating behind knee walls and yeah, so many different, uh, specifics of of styles yeah i mean this kind of comes full circle to our conversation from from early on brian you're you're smart enough and i wasn't when i bought my house experienced enough to know where to look for problems and a lot of these if you if you can recognize the style and period of the house you can just look at it from the outside and have a pretty good guess as to what problems you're going to find when you go inside that house so i i would love to put 
an article like that together. Yeah, and and you can look at the era of the house and the location of the house, and you know if you've been. I mean, I obviously you know don't have um, the same knowledge of of you know all parts of the country. I, I know much more about what what's happened in the Northeast at different time periods than than anywhere else. But I'm sure if you're in the you know in the desert Southwest and you find a local builder who's been who's been working on uh, you know houses there for 50 years. He's going to be able to tell you exactly what what you're going to run into with your with your new home. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> they fixed it all. <laughs> it seems like a series of articles. Like we need to get regional pages from different people from around the country, right? That would be awesome. And you folks out in other parts of the country outside the Northeast, we always want to hear from you. And uh, we don't hear from you enough. So if you got a question, you got a something you want to talk about, please weigh in because we value all of you from all over the country. You guys have anything to add before we part company? No. Nope. Crickets. Okay. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Brian, Rob, and Jeff for joining me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or view us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Stay safe and happy building. Happy building.